Perfect. Okay. Okay. So short introduction or refresher on value investing. What is it? Basically, if you talk about value, then you mean you usually mean gold, be it price to earnings, price to sales, price to book, or price to cash flow, and this on a normalized basis. Okay. Where did, where does it start? It usually, I'll usually tell you it started with Graham and Dodd with this very important book. Let me ask a question. Who has it in his library? Who bought it? Who owns it? And of those, who might did read it? Okay. <laughs> so this is uh, 1934, the Bible on uh, value investing. Uh, the idea of identify, identifying firms with low prices relative to their intrinsic value. Intrinsic value, again, defined by uh, P, dividend history, stability of earnings, and so on. The next milestone, in my view, was, was 1949. Again, uh, Graham, without dot, it is the book, The Intelligent Investor. Who owns this one? Who did read it? Okay, it's a little bit more, as I expect. The difference here is it's, it's more focused on the individual investor, and the main thing here is the, this concept of the margin of safety, saying, okay, you have an intrinsic value, and you want to buy it at a discount uh, to this intrinsic value, so it gives you a margin of safety. Then, value effect, the value premium was first uh, proved by Basel in 1977. Of course, since then, many papers have been written, and more or less, uh, so the same results. Uh, he came up, he's, he checked out the low, the lowest quintile of the stock with the lowest PE, and he came up with the conclusion that they had a, an outperformance, risk adjusted outperformance of 4.5% per year. And the data range was 56 to 69, so quite substantial. What are the explanations for this value premium? You have rational ones and the behavioral ones. The rational ones would be basically, yes, it's a, you get a risk premium for, it's a, it's a compensation for losing money in, in difficult times. It also can be relative and performance, of course. And, and the behavioral ones like investor <coughs> overreaction, bad news, and stock going down much too pay. Volkswagen, perhaps, I don't know. Perhaps you'll hear about that. And then over extrapolation, perhaps uh, just expecting a past high uh, growth rates to, to continue to the different definitely like perhaps Amazon and so. And then this gives you then good uh, starting points to acquire cheap stocks at a low relative valuation. 1993, Farm and French with a three-factor model. And of course you know that you have, you have the risk-free rate. Into the RF risk free rate and the beta, and then he came up with the, the size factor. He was checking uh, small minus big uh, cap stocks, and again, the, the value factor uh, high minus low book to market. Lately, factor investing has become popular, I believe that's my impression. And factor investing, you have on the one side the macro factors growth, inflation, volatility, and other ones. Difficult to invest or almost impossible to invest. You cannot invest in growth, right? And then the investment factors. Again, you have the size and value, French, pharma, French, right? And momentum as an additional factor. So then, of course, the crucial question is if it's so superior to anything else, why is not doing everybody while investing? And by that, of course, you would. Uh, uh, lose this premium because of everybody does it right, so it kind of uh, yeah, has to go away. We will perhaps get a few answers about for that question later on, I hope so. So now I did a little chart. Uh, I took the MSCI World value and the MSCI World, and you'll see like, starting in 75. Very nice outperformance of, of uh, value stocks. So if you start at 100, you're up to 1,926 for the value. And stocks and then the, the global index the normal one is 1,769. So obviously it worked over that time span. No risk adjustment, of course, but very simple chart. On the other hand, if you look at relative performance, then you see you, you really have some cycles here. 
March 2000. This was, of course, the internet bubble. Everybody was going into technology stocks. Value it underperformed heavily. And then the internet bubble burst. We have the snapback rally of value style again. And then since about December 2006, again, very slowly, but underperforming quite steadily. And here, I put it together, you have, uh, you see the, the world value is on top and then not below the, the world index. So difference since 2006 is 16% uh, to the advantage of the, the world index, not the, the value index. And analyzed, you have a difference, an underperformance of approximately 1.5% of the value stocks. So tough uh, thing. So the conclusion for me would be uh, in the very long, in the long run, or perhaps in the very long run, outperformance of value, but you have significant underperformance in lower, in shorter time periods, like for example the last nine years. Good. So that's what I found out about value investing. So I would like to hand over to uh, Vitaly. I could ask you a favor. Can you go back to like one of the first slides? No. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so yeah, I'm gonna start. I'm gonna start with. So it's kind of funny. I don't have a formal presentation because I was gonna talk about something else. But I'm so excited that I get to talk about this precise topic. So a little bit, a little bit, just for a little bit about myself. As you can tell uh, by my very charming accent, I was. Um, even though I do live in America, an American citizen, I was born in Russia, and my family immigrated to the United States in 1991. Um, so my day job is managing money. I'm a portfolio manager, just like Guy uh, and Gork. Um, so uh, let me tell you a story. This is a true story. It happened literally three or four days ago. Um, I was talking to my British friend. Who is a great value investor, and I was telling that I'm going to Europe talk to you know talk about value investing, etc. He said, "You gotta tell them that they got the value investing thing wrong completely." This is again, this is not me saying. This is my British friends saying. He said, "Europeans don't understand value investing." And if you go back uh, to the start, right. were you about to get? You do want it, okay? Oh yes, yeah, no, I did want it. Yes, yes. yes. <laughs> um, so anyway, so let me tell you this story. So, so anyway, so he said. They get it completely wrong. So let me tell you the story. So in 2011, I went to Guy Spears conference, Value X, Value X, and it was an incredible event. And I thought I should do one in in, uh, in Colorado. So I live in Colorado. So I decided I'm going to do a conference in Vail, Colorado, which I call a better version of clusters. Sorry, guys. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, and um, so it's, but Vail is a very beautiful town. It's very ritzy and inexpensive. So I uh, you know, put up this conference and I get an email. I think it was a European guy who said, Vitali, this is like so not value investing because this is expensive. You know, the hotels are expensive, everything there is expensive. And for about five minutes, I thought maybe he's right. But then I realized. And so I was thinking, maybe I should have the conference like in Mattel 6, where it's like 30 dollars a day, kind of hotel, like somewhere by the airport, something cheap. But then I realized, this guy is wrong. And here's why. This is how people perceive value investing. This, you know, basically uh, 30, you know, the cheap 30 dollars a day hotel, that's what people think value investing is. Uh, and, uh, but they're wrong. Here's why. Thank you very much. Okay. If you read, if this is this is the slide I want. So if you read the first two books that were mentioned, and you get out of this that you should buy low price to earning stocks, low price to sales stocks, stocks that trade at a low price to book and etc. This would if you get this message out of the uh, intelligent investor or security analysis, you did not get the message. Okay, in fact. Uh, here is another story. I wrote another. I wrote an article where I basically called Charlie Munger Warren Buffett's sidekick. Okay, I get a friend. I get an email from a friend. Uh, his name is Jeff Matthews. He wrote an incredible book called Pilgrimage to Omaha. It's a great book about Warren Buffett. I really recommend you read it. So, and Jeff says, Vitaly, you're wrong. You should not call Charlie Munger Warren Buffett's sidekick because Charlie Munger changed the way Warren Buffett invests. So at the 90th, Charlie Munger's 90th birthday, 
Warren Buffett took out a letter that Charlie Munger wrote to him a long, long time ago, which explicitly, explicitly said, if you keep doing this, you cannot scale Berkshire Hathaway. Just think about it for a second. Berkshire Hathaway was this kind of stock, right? It was a, it was a single digit price to earnings kind of stock and ended up in complete failure, basically. Uh, so he said, if you continue to do this, you're gonna, you're gonna, you won't be able to scale your Berkshire Hathaway. So this is what I would call a one-dimensional investing. Okay? You're just looking for one dimension, cheap. Um, statistically, this is important, statistically inexpensive stock. Okay? I'm not saying just because it's cheap, but that Mattel, Thunia, Mattel 6 hotel, I mean, Mattel 6 hotel at $30 a day may actually be expensive. If, it's, you know, if, if nothing that works in the cockroaches, right? So, so this is one dimensional investing. So Warren Buffett, so I'll, I'll tell you the lessons you should have taken out from those two books, but, uh, but what Warren Buffett did, he said, I'm gonna take this and I'm gonna add two more dimensions. Okay, the one dimension is gonna be growth. There is value in growth, right? If companies grow in earnings, Google. There is value, you know, if you, Google created a lot of value because its earnings went up, I don't know, three or four or five-fold over the last many, many years, okay? Uh, so there is value in that, okay? So the stock may not, be, may not be statistically cheap, but that value that's gonna create is worth something. So that's one dimension. Another dimension is quality. If company, if company has a sustainable competitive advantage, then you can look forward 10 years from now and say, I feel very comfortable that these cash flows will be there. I think, I think it's extremely, extremely important. So those are basically three now. So Warren Buffett added two more dimensions to this. A um, couple more points. What I think people get, uh, two, uh, two things people, I think, get wrong when they look at Warren Buffett. Number one, they say he's a buy and hold investor. Okay? First of all, to some degree, he has to be a buy and hold investor because he, you know, he owns very large stakes, which would be difficult to sell sometimes. Number one, because he has low, uh, low cost basis. And number three, I guess, because he, a lot of times when he bought those businesses, uh, when he buys private businesses, he makes a promise that he's never gonna sell, okay? So that kind of puts him in a, and it makes him buy and hold investor, but he sells sometimes when he has to. He sold Tesco when he thought there was a problem there. He sold McDonald's, I wanna say late 90s, when he, when he thought there were structural problems with the company. He wished he, he sold Coke, and actually he admitted that in public, you know, he wished he sold Coke in, in 1999. Okay, so that's one thing that you should not be. Just because you bought a company, you should not just hold it just because you bought it. You know, it has to be still undervalued, or it still has to be growing, and so the, if you still see value in the growth, if the company is still undervalued based on three dimensions, then you should continue to hold it. If not, you should sell it. And another point I think people miss about Buffett is this. Um, people say, you know, Buffett says that he doesn't care what the economy is going to do, in the, you know, over the next six months. So value investors said basically, we don't care about we don't care about macro. Okay, in 2007, a lot of value investors got killed because they said we don't, you know, we don't care about macro forecasting. Okay, so after 2007 crisis, 2008 crisis, every value investor I know now is a is a except these two guys, are uh, basically as a macro forecaster. They have a very good idea what the economy is going to do in the next three years. Okay? Well, I think this is the real lesson. The lesson is this. Warren Buffett does not care what the economy is going to do in the next six months, but he does care about structural issues. Okay? He doesn't care about the weather, in other words. He cares about climate change and events. Okay? Climate change and events would be, like you know, I think in 1999 or 2000, he wrote about the U.S. dollar being overvalued. That's important, right? That's not important in the next six months. That's a structural issue. He was aware of the housing crisis. He was, a, he was aware of the uh, derivatives, weapons of mass destruction. So he does pay attention to, you know, to those things. He just doesn't care what the unemployment number is gonna be in six months. So this is uh, very quickly, uh, so, the, so the two more, a few more points. Let me tell you how I, you know, I'm actually, I know how Guy invests. He does very well, and I, I look at the, Jordan's portfolio, so I, these guys probably do the same thing I do. And we have a lot of overlap. But basically, what you should have gotten out of the security analysis are these three things. First of all, uh, when you analyze companies, when you buy stocks, you're not buying just pieces of paper, you're buying businesses, okay? So either you're buying uh, 
uh, 5% of the company or 0.5% or 1% of the company, not the whole company. We analyze the company as we are buying the whole business. That's point number one. The, uh, point number two, risk is not uh, volatility, it's a permanent loss of capital. Volatility is there basically just, just like Mr. Market to help us. Okay, it's, but the risk is not volatility. Volatility uh, risk is when the value of the business declines and never comes back. That's that's a true risk. And uh, third, did I say margin of safety? Oh, okay. So that's 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 an important one. Margin of safety. Okay. So we are looking to buy dollar for less. Okay. That and how much less is going to depend on company on company's growth rate and co and, the, and the business quality. If the higher the quality of the company, the less margin of safety we need. The lower the quality, the more margin of safety we need. Same thing as growth. And uh, I keep losing my notes. <laughs> okay, so uh, slight uniqueness of our, our approach. I read somewhere that Warren Buffett does not do spreadsheets. He does everything in my head. When I read that, I'm like, you know what? I'm going to be Warren Buffett. I'm not going to do spreadsheets. I couldn't do it. So I realized, you know what? And I think if you read Guy's book, by the way, you should show it. Guys talk about you know, that too, that he, you need to find your inner Warren Buffett, I guess, or inner self. So what I found that Warren Buffett, you know, he's so smart, he doesn't need to do spreadsheets. I'm not smart enough, so we do a lot of spreadsheets. And the reason we do spreadsheets, and this is important, we, when we model a company, we try to kill it. A lot of times you buy stocks that are absolutely hate it, okay? And, we, we, and a lot of times you, what you find that, that that hate is more than reflected. In the, in, in the share price, okay? So, got, got, okay, perfect, okay, in the share price. So if, I'll give you a story. Okay, so let me, when you see the performance of the, how value has not done well, I, I thought it personally. So I'm gonna brag because this happened yesterday and I'm very proud of this. So we bought a company that declined, the stock declined from a $16 to eight. Uh, we bought it at nine and went down to eight after we bought it. And the story was like this. It's basically a company in the United States called LifeLock, okay? And I'm not bragging, but I'm gonna tell you all throughout, and I'm gonna walk you through our process very quickly. Um, so the, the stock declined a lot, and here's why it just declined, because the government sued the company, and the government said, you basically misadvertised. You know, you misadvertised your product, and uh, so the stock got halved. So we went, you know, we went through and did our analysis, and we found that in the worst possible case, the fine the government could impose would be $500 million. Okay, so then we said, okay, what is the company worth if that fine, in the worst possible case, is $500 million? We went through the math and we found that the company has $300 million of cash on the balance sheet, no debt. Company generates about $100 million a year of cash, of cash loss. So if that lawsuit goes through and if it doesn't, you know, if it doesn't get settled, in the worst possible case, payout would be $500 million. So we know what, what is the worst case, basically. We knew that. Okay, what we also figured out that if that happens, in two years the company would have earnings power, let's say, dollar fifty. Okay, and we were paying eight dollars for it. Okay, so that basically, we, you know, so what we figured out based on you know, just very simple models, that in the worst case we're not going to lose money. It may be painful in the short run, and we, you know, but in the long run, even if the, in the worst case happens, we're still going to make money. Yesterday, guy and I with the opera. And in the, as in the finale of the opera, I looked at my phone, and the company reported that they settled the case with the government, and they're going to pay him 116 million dollars, which is a lot less than 500. And the stock is up 45 percent today, so I'm very happy. Remember, I'm, I, I suffered a lot of misery that we saw that you know, value underperforming. I suffered a lot of that. So anyway, but this is what we try to do. We try to find where a lot of news is already more than priced in. Okay, and, and when everybody when everybody hates it, a lot of times you find that it's in the, it's in the, it's in the price. So, uh, let me see, I think I covered most of the points I wanted to make. Yeah, I think that's it. So, thank you very much. Uh, so, thank you everyone for coming here and for listening to the three of us. Uh, is there a way for me not to breathe on the microphone? That would be pretty bad if we did that the whole time. So, uh, Vitaly, thank you. Thank you very much. You know, Vitaly's mother tongue is Russian. And I think it's extraordinary when I think how Vitaly masters the English language. 
And uh, I think it's really special. It's quite incredible how you've achieved so much in the United States. Fatali immigrated into the United States when he was age 19. Uh, and you know, there's another immigrant to the United States that I only realized uh, that Ben Graham was born in London. I didn't know that. And then he had this amazing career in the United States. I don't know if um, being an outsider helps you to be a value investor, but I suspect that it does. Uh, Monish Pavrai was also an immigrant into the United States. And uh, I know that there's uh, Peter Wultrich and Markus Hanser here. It's great to have you here. If you come to ValueX, you'll see the biggest collection of oddballs you've ever seen in your life. And um, so, you know, uh, I wanted to give you a very different sense of uh, what the value in value investing means. And, you know, uh, when Ben Graham came up with the idea of holding a Geiger counter over stocks to see what was cheap statistically, the word never arose to call it cheapness investing. I don't know why that is. But uh, anybody who's read uh, the latest book by Larry Cunningham called Berkshire Beyond Buffett, um, he really spends the time talking about, you know, not value as in I bought something for a low price relative to its value, but human values. And he talks about how Berkshire Hathaway is a company based on very strong human values than anyone who's been to the annual meeting of Berkshire Hathaway will hear uh, Charlie Munger say at least once, a, des a web of deserved trust. And there are stories that emerge out of Berkshire Hathaway and relationships between people who are made who attend the meetings where uh, you do business better because you're doing business within a web of deserved trust. Uh, uh, Bill Gates wrote an article a good decade or more ago called Business at the Speed of Trust. And uh, I think that when I think of the last chapter of my book, The Search for True Value, I think that where value investing goes at the end of the day, especially during an age where we just can't find the kinds of things that Warren Buffett bought, are the search for true value. Uh, so just to step back from that for a second, uh, Warren Buffett, in uh, one of his letters that is circling around the internet, talks about his purchase of Sanborn Map. You know, each one of us in this room has an IQ that's well above the average. Just, to, just when you sign on to the CFA Society, your IQ immediately jumps 100 points. You know, then you pass exam one and it jumps another 100 points and you end up with a lot of IQ points. But none of us would have needed a lot of IQ points to understand that Sanborn map was cheap. It was trading at a fraction of the portfolio of marketable securities and it was a profitable business. None of that stuff exists today. And the job that we have is an awful lot harder uh, as Greg Alexander said at the Sequoia Fund annual meeting, uh, the index has gotten a lot better. The index against which Ben Graham was competing was a highly inefficient index. And the index that we're competing against is far more efficient because the CFA Society is educating all these wonderful people to do fundamental analysis and they go into all these firms and guess what? They bid the prices of stocks to approximately the right price. So I'm going to tell you how I deal with that because there's some pretty depressing news about that. It means that, you know, half or perhaps more than half of us will underperform the indices. Uh, Charlie Munger has said that a number of times, but stop and think about that. You know, we're, uh, the, what is it? Look to the left and the right of you. And we'll survive economically as individuals, uh, but we will have net not added value in terms of what we do uh, uh, by the end of our careers. We would have been better off going and doing carpentry. We would have added more value to the economy. Uh, that's a pretty, pretty scary thought, and um, I'll come back to that. But I want to just call out another thing about this group, and I'm going to include myself in this group with Georg. Uh, but without Vitaly in this case, is that I moved to Zurich for a very specific reason that I articulated to my wife before I came here. Uh, I feel very strongly that Zurich 
embodies the values that Berkshire Hathaway has implicitly every day. And uh, I'll explain why in a second, but it kind of frustrates me that Georg is the only famous value investor here. I feel like Zurich should be a center of excellence for value investing, a center of excellence for analysis, that people come to Zurich not for quantitative stuff, not for all sorts of other garbage that people are selling, but for solid uh, financial analysis, for the rational, clear-minded thinking that the Swiss are famous for. If we talk about the web of deserved trust, I remember walking into a shop not far from my office to buy wine for my wife. I should have bought flowers, as Vitaly said to me the other day, but I wanted to buy wine, and I didn't have time, and it turns out I'm very forgetful. I don't have my wallet with me. And this is like, I've just arrived. And the guy looks at me and says, no problem. Come back tomorrow and just give me the money tomorrow. I'm like, can I give you, can I ein Gegenstand lassen? Can ich mein Kreditkarte et, etwas lassen? No, that's fine. Come back tomorrow. You know, I sort of like dropped on the floor. I couldn't believe it. That is, you know, we all love taking the trams. I've been introducing Vitaly to the tram system and explaining to him he doesn't have to take taxis. The first time I visited Peter Wultrich, he heard that I'd taken a taxi. He said, this will not do. And he took me down to the uh, train station and bought me a tram pass. And he said, now, from now on, you will take trams when you're in Zurich. But where else in the world are you just able to hop onto a tram because there's a, a web of a deserved trust in which this society lives? <clears throat> People try to understand why Switzerland is so competitive, given how expensive everything is. And Vitaly, the reason why is that when you can rely on the system being the way it is, and when you can rely on other people to be honest, there's so much garbage that you don't have to go through. But I'm frustrated with Zurich because I feel like the two large banks and large institutions smother some of the amazing intellectual creativity uh, that exists here in Zurich. And I believe that if the structure of the industry which is here was slightly different, would have probably a lot more firms. I think that Georg, he'll probably tell you more, but it's, it's, it should be less difficult for Georg to do what he does here in Zurich. And less difficult means that Georg, and I guess to the extent that I'm now a Zurich-based guy, we should have more competition. Uh, uh, and I'm not sure, well, it, it's because of the structure of the industry, but I really hope that in five or 10 years' time, Zurich will be compared to Boston. And in addition to great firms like Fidelity and Putnam, there'll be the equivalents in Zurich of Seth Klarman and, and others. And there are many, many value-based funds in Boston. So uh, that's just a sort of a plea and a request. Uh, but just to give you sort of my take for uh, how long do I have? I'm, I'm at 10 minutes. That's good. So... The thing that I realized was that I am, and I, I'm saying this, this is not false modesty, I am not smarter than anyone else in this room. And I want to outsmart you to the extent that we're all portfolio managers or uh, stock analysts. How on earth I'm gonna, am I going to outsmart people who are uh, just as smart as me? And what is utterly clear to me is that the right way to do it is behaviorally. So I can't be smarter than you, but I might be able to behave better than you uh, when it comes to what happens in the marketplace. And so the model that I have of myself is the guy who's sort of stumbling around like a drunk, and every now and then he lunges for a security to buy. And uh, I believe, by the way, that that's the vast majority of people in uh, the equities markets and in the financial markets. And it's just that the vast majority of people don't recognize it. There's a whole bunch of ex post rationalization that takes place as to why we did something, a whole bunch of analysis. Uh, uh, and so, but once I accept that self image and I, I rip away the idea that I'm actually rational and I accept that I'm only rational in spots at times, then I can start adjusting for that. And so I uh, believe if I, so I've outperformed to date. Since the beginning of year, I've outperformed less than I had. I'm having a horrible year. Uh, but if I outperform going forwards, and if I look back in 10 or 20 years' time and look back at it having been one of the few who's added value, it's because I would have uh, managed my behavior better. And it comes down to 
uh, relatively small number of uh, rules, behavioral rules that I try to adhere to. So first of all, um, you know, I'm going to piggyback off Georg's research. So Georg does an enormous amount of analysis. I went to his office once. He has an extraordinary group of people working there. He's a special guy. So uh, each one of these companies is something that I will look at and know that it has passed Georg's smell test. And uh, that is a good thing. We were taught at universities to, to do original thought. We do not have to do an original thought in the financial markets. We can see what other people own. And so I do, uh, uh, I reverse engineer why people own what they own. I look at the portfolios of David Einhorn, Bill Ackman, Georg von Wies, Warren Buffett, Ted Wexter, try and understand what they own. Every now and then, I think that I've got it absolutely right. I do understand it, and the stock is still cheap enough. That is when I will buy it, but it's like a bit like bowling with, uh, with, the, with the things up. So that's what I'm trying to do to help me, and it's amazing. So uh, I, I'm, I have the confidence that somebody else has done that analysis. The next thing that uh, I copied straight from Monish Pabrai is I try to almost exclusively only give orders to the stock market when the stock market is closed. The number of times that I've looked at the screen and what's going on in the screen, the price action changes what I want to do, so I try and just keep that away from me. Uh, another thing that uh, people have heard, I had a guy visit me in the office today to get a, um, a, an autograph for my book. He was curious to see it. The stock monitor is switched off for weeks at a time. I really don't want to look. And, there's a famous, another fantastic guy who lives here, a guy called uh, Rolf Debelli, who talks about uh, how he took himself off the news diet. And the fact is, what he discovered was that when there was an important event in the world, he found out about it. I found that even if I don't check the stock monitor, when there's an important event related to the companies that I own, it finds me out. I, I learn about it without having to watch a price wiggling around. Very important, I, uh, once I buy it, I can't sell it for two years at least. And that takes away, first of all, it forces me to think very carefully about what I own because I'm going to have to live with it for two years. And it's no fun owning something you don't like for two years. And um, uh, it, it helps me to get over the uh, desire just to kick it out of the portfolio. So I, right now, I'm experiencing for the third time in my life, I would not prefer not to experience it once, an experience where a stock in my portfolio has gone down 90%. You know, where the hell was the margin of safety there? You know, <laughs> believe me, when I bought it, I thought there was a lot of margin of safety. Uh, in um, the past two cases of stocks that I've sold, one I sold at a profit, and the other sold at, I sold at a slight loss. So after seeing a 90% drop, I had a kind of a, you know, you know substantial rise. I have, uh, so, so the, the pressure, if I, for example, were to talk publicly about it or to um, check the stock price every day to sell, would be overwhelming. And I've done that in the past. But I'm creating environments such that I won't do that. So uh, these kind of behavioral changes, I think, are what will make a difference as investors. Uh, I think that if you work at an institutional farm, I don't believe in making decisions as uh, in a committee. I believe that one person should make decisions. Institutional firms are often built up in such a way that in order to market themselves, they have to sell the team. But I just don't think that teams make good decisions. And so somebody who's working as part of an investment team, I believe, is uh, at a disadvantage. I believe that I have an advantage there. There are a small number of teams that I know of that have done extraordinary jobs. The uh, group at Ruane Cuniff has done as an extraordinary job. They are the one firm that Warren Buffett recommended to his investors when he shut down um, his uh, Buffett partnerships. There's a company called Southeastern Asset Management with a guy called Staley Cates running it, who also has an extraordinary team and have put out extraordinary results. So if you work at that kind of place, then you're probably fine. But if you don't work at that kind of place, or if you make the comparison between what is it about those teams at Ruane Conniff and uh, at um, Southeastern Asset Management that makes them function so well, and the team that you're a part of is not got those qualities, you might want to go and work uh, somewhere else. 
so I, I will just leave you with uh, one thought and get in under the 20 minutes. In fact, under the 18 minutes that is required for TED is that if we go back to what I said at the beginning, fully half of us are not going to outperform. So how do we justify our lives? And I think that there's something very, very important that we can do. I know that we don't think ourselves as investment bankers, but you know, the outside world doesn't make a distinction. We're just all finance types. And we're amongst uh, the most hated people in society right now. Many of them don't say it, but they, they feel like that the industry that we're a part of has wreaked havoc on the rest of the world in recent history. And it's not enough for us just to say, oh, that was the investment bankers, that was the guy structuring mortgages, that was not me. I think that we have to just accept that the blame is coming to us and take real responsibility. After all, a big part of the reason why I'm in this industry and a big part of the reason why many of us in this room in this industry is because we're smart, we can manipulate numbers, we're good at taking exams, and we like making good amounts of money. And we prefer doing that than many other activities that would bring us less money. And that's fine, provided uh, we don't engage in unbridled greed. So once we've made a certain amount of money, we need to really start thinking about not growing our wealth, but growing the social, our social capital and the social capital of people around us. Uh, it means that if we get to lead firms, and some of us here maybe already do lead firms or in the future will lead firms, it means that we have to make sure that we're in a position to take decisions that benefit society perhaps before the shareholders or choose not to do things because it's just not right. Those were the values of the financial industry, but they don't seem to be the values right now, or at least they're not the values that we're known for. And if anybody is going to change the industry, it's going to be people in the investment management arm, because we are, after all, the most thoughtful. And compared to the rest, we are smarter as well. But I really think that we, we need to sh think about showing leadership. And I know it's hard for each of us to do, because we're all stuck in a specific place with all the tensions and pressures and difficulties. But believe me, if we don't think about it, nobody else is. And at the end of the day, I believe that Warren Buffett is, in a certain sense, the greatest philosopher of capitalism of the last 200 years. And he built on the robber barons like um, John D. Rockefeller and Andrew Carnegie. But what he taught us is a better way of being capitalists. And the real meaning in value investing is becoming a person with real values. And I think we're well placed in this room to do it. And I'm really looking forward to seeing Zurich become a center of excellence for value investing. Thank you. Well, thank you very much uh, for all being here. Um, I'm going to give you a boring technocratic speech after all this colorful insights that you've had before. I apologize, but I am the only Swiss guy here. <laughs> <clears throat> so um, as far as, as value invest, you know, a conference like this where, you, where it's about the differences between value investing, it's a little bit like going to the Weinschiff and then um, tasting nothing but Pinot Noir. You know, at the end of the day, it's Pinot Noir. Um, and some of them are better, some of them are, are different. And, and I would say in terms of us value guys, um, you know, at the end of the day, the day it's, it's, it's value. We all try to buy stocks that are cheap. Uh, if, if we do differ from each other, it's on how cheap we want the stocks to be, so that the, the size of the margin of safety. Uh, maybe the difference is in the techniques that we use to analyze stocks. Some of us will do it one way or some of us will do it a little differently. These are small differences. A third difference might be our hunting grounds. We'll restrict ourselves to certain markets, certain types of securities. And the fourth difference, of course, is going to be the degree of diversification in the portfolio. Uh, an example uh, of a highly diversified portfolio would be Tweedy Browns. It'll have over 200 stocks in, a, in, in their funds, and we'll have maybe 25 to 30. Um, the first difference, the degree of margin of safety is probably the biggest difference between value investors and where you, you, you'll find the most uh, 
you'll find the most philosophical difference, but I'm actually going to talk about the other ones. Uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about how we go through the process of value investing, just so you see, um, based on one example, what makes us uh, unique or not unique, just how we do it. I don't think we're unique. In fact, a lot of what I'm going to tell you is boring textbook stuff, and um, I hope you don't fall asleep since I'm the last speaker anyway. Um, if I could have the first slide. Oh, I'm supposed to use this thingy. To, um, would you have a click? Huh? Okay. So I think I've got four, fair, uh, four characteristics that define us. And, and let me emphasize the us. Thank you very much, Guy, for the bloom and for the flowers. But it's, we are a team as well, Thomas Brown. And I, we make the investment management decisions, and our third partner, Erich Müller, is just as important. He's our, for those of you who did military service, he's our Feldweibel. He's the sergeant. He takes care of everything else, and that's not to be, under, the value of that is not to be underestimated in a small firm. But anyway, uh, to, to what we do is, so we focus on normalized uh, cash flows and er, uh, earnings. We've seen the word normalized before. I think that's very typical of value investing. Um, then we do highly detailed research. We, we look at the companies in great detail. I'll bore you with that in a minute. Uh, third characteristic, we're very disciplined. We will only buy at a 40% uh, margin of safety or greater. And, um, well, we, we, we'll, we'll bend that rule a little bit, but not 35%. And it has to be a wonderful, wonderful company. And then the, the fourth uh, thing is we're very patient. Uh, we have time on our side, and, and that's really the greatest asset value investors have. So let me tell you about how we, we do research on a new idea. The point, of course, as you know, is, is to, first of all, to analyze how a business has performed historically to understand the drivers uh, behind it. And to that end, we go to the annual reports. We try to capture at least one business cycle um, in our spreadsheets. And then we also uh, go back and take quarterlies for maybe two or three years. So the raw material for our work is the complete financial statements, and I mean complete financial statements up to and including the comprehensive income statement in the case of banks and insurance companies. Obviously, that's not going to be so important for most industrials. We use uh, predefined and pre-formatted spreadsheets to make our work um, more efficient. I'll, this is just a couple of lines of, of our main spreadsheet. This is for uh, Ronstadt Holding. It's a temporary employment agency. And you see here, I've got inventory terms, which of course makes absolutely no sense in that business. But it's on the spreadsheet. It spits out a number. We ignore it. Receivables turn is on there. Days of receivables is a little uh, further below. Everything is right there already. We never argue about how to define ratios. And it just, it's a lot faster to put in the numbers uh, when you work with something like this. Everything that you guys learned in the CFA exam is in here somewhere, I hope or almost everything, except for the theoretical stuff. But in terms of boring old financial analysis, financial statement analysis, we've, 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 we've got it ready to go. Um, obviously, where necessary, and that's in most cases, we also go into the business segment information. And then um, we don't look just at the financial data. We also look at uh, the KPIs, the stuff that companies disclose in presentations, in the MDNA of the annual reports. Uh, the things they tell you, so we go and talk to them. Uh, we try to capture really everything that we think might be important for, for, um, for analysis. And as those of you who do this stuff know, you, you don't really get a true picture of a company just by reading its disclosures and speaking to the company itself. You also have to talk to other companies or at least do the analysis on them. We'll do that. Uh, we will also speak to industry experts. Uh, we'll... Um, customers, clients, whatever, and we read broker reports. The in-depth pieces are very interesting very often, lots of information in those, and we read the newspaper. So the goal of all this is to try and understand the microeconomics of the business and the company's specific condition. You know, uh, what's the business like? How is the company doing? How's the management doing? Have they created value? Do they de destroy capital? Do they create it, etc.? All those typical things. And as far as we're concerned, we almost never look at things that don't, that have not generated cash flow in the past, except when we do. Like, for example, when 2005, when we bought a pay TV company called Premier in Ausgai Deutschland. But even there, um, well, whatever. We'll, we'll get back to that one. But normally, historical, uh, it's important for us to, 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 that the company generate cash. 
Now, all of the historical research is obviously in the context of, of looking forward, trying to figure out what the company is going to earn in the future. And, that, and so the, 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 the question that governs all of this is how much cash flow is this go company going to generate for our shareholders in the future? And in that context, the two most important variables are the rate of organic sales growth. It's a very important component of valuation, how fast the company grows. You all remember the, the, the Gordon growth model as a simple expression of that. Um, and then the second is going to be the level of normalized EBIT margins. So those are the number one and number two. And then, of course, we're also going to try and estimate tax rates, uh, capital absorption to achieve that growth, all, all that stuff. Once we have a good and conservative estimate of what we think a company's worth, uh, what the cash flows are going to be, then we have to value it. And again, we go back to normalized multiples. Um, we use all the tools available. You know, we're Catholic with a small c. Uh, even, even enterprise value multiples, uh, EBITDA, sales, God knows what, price book, price sa uh, price earnings. I wouldn't use price to sales. I don't think that one's very good. But uh, enterprise value to sales is very good. And the point of all of them is that each multiple provides a different perspective on the same thing. It, no one number will give you um, a view of a company in its entirety. But if you look at it from different angles, and this is the cheesy slide I came up with this afternoon uh, to, to drive home this point because I was taught that, that is, you, you'll remember it better. Um, if, if you have a visual that goes with it, is um, if you look at something from different angles, and that's what multiples help you do, then you get a better picture of it. And also, if your price to book value tells you it's cheap, but EV to sales says it's not, then you probably don't understand yet the, the investment case. And it all has to, to fit together. Um, we use NPVs as well. Okay, so uh, once we then have a value, uh, an, an estimate of the intrinsic uh, value. Oh, yeah, and for the NPVs, I'm sorry, one, one more thing. Uh, NPVs, I'm not a huge fan of because it's so easy to manipulate the, multi, uh, you know, the, 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 the growth uh, assumption and get what you want, but it's still a valuable tool to test your assumptions. What, what Thomas Brown and I particularly like is free cash flow yield. You know, it's simple, it's very powerful, and whenever we use uh, some sort of those two meth methods, we're discounting at a cost of equity of 10%. We uh, don't think that the classic derivation of cla uh, cost of equity, the way we've all learned it with beta and all that, is, is very um, convincing, to choose my words carefully. And um, I'll be blunt, and I think an equity investor who doesn't try and achieve a 10% return over time is probably in the wrong business. So um, we're going... Once we've, 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 we've uh, come up with the intrinsic value of the company, um, then actually things get very um, easy. Oh, I'm sorry, I left out one important point. What we do is we assume that the intrinsic value is reached in three years. So we're going to assume that if a company is not earning what it should be, that the earnings will normalize in three years. We'll assume that the multiple is normalized in three years. And then we discount that back at 10% to get the present intrinsic value of the company. Now, why the three years? The three years allows us to think past current problems. You know, most of the companies we look at are cheap for a reason. Uh, maybe they're at a bad point in the cycle. Think oil, think metals at the moment. Um, maybe they have a management problem. Maybe they have a product problem. God knows what. And, and uh, you know, the market largely is efficient. If it wasn't, value investing wouldn't work because the premise is obviously that stocks will, will go back to their intrinsic value. And so um, the things are going to be cheap for a reason. You want to look past those problems. The three-year assumption just allows us to look past those problems. Uh, we discount the thing back, and then we get a, a, a good idea of what we think it's worth uh, today. We sort of abstract from the current noise. Uh, a complete analysis, by the way, when, when the way we do it will take us from a few weeks to a few months, depending on how complicated the story is. Okay, but so once we do have the intrinsic value, um, our lives get very... It, it actually becomes quite easy... Um, in terms of what we do next, which is, you know, the fancy word for that is portfolio construction, but I just mean buying or selling uh, stocks. Um, we have very simple decision rules. We will buy something if it's trading at a 40% discount to intrinsic value. We will sell something if it's at intrinsic value. 
we don't discuss that. If we think the intrinsic values are correct, then we buy or sell based on those that, uh, based on that uh, that estimate. We will uh, sell something if it's not an intrinsic value, if we have a better idea, something that's cheaper or maybe less risky or both, ideally. And sometimes we'll also trim a position if a stock has gotten really big and it's trading close to its intrinsic value. But normally we, we try to go all the way to the top, which sometimes work, usually works and doesn't always. Those are then the stocks I have to talk about every damn year. <laughs> Now, all of our decisions are made independently of our history with the stock. In other words, whether or not we have made money with the position, whether or not we have estimated its intrinsic value correctly or poorly in the past does not matter. All that matters is our best estimate of the intrinsic value today and the price relative to, to, uh, to this, uh, to this uh, intrinsic value. That's all that we care about. The idea is that we try to stay objective. Of course, we analyze our mistakes to try and figure out what we could do better as analysts. But you want to stay rational looking forward. And even when you look back, you, you don't want any finger pointing, yelling, or screaming, or tears. You just want to understand, what did I do wrong? How can I get better? The good thing about our business is everybody stays humble all the time um, because you're constantly making mistakes. Okay, so these decision rules lead to portfolios that look as follows. In our case, you've got 20 to 30 names. Uh, the cash levels rise or fall in function of two things. One, our ability to find new ideas. And secondly, the speed at which our holdings reach intrinsic value. We do not steer the cash level explicitly. Um, so if we find things, then we're happy, um, and otherwise the cash has to go up, and then we have to hope we find something soon. If a stock is trading at less than 40% of intrinsic value, so we're not, you don't want to add to the position, but it's not where you sell it, then we just wait. We just pray. Um, you could optimize that in theory by doing, you know, by switching between this one's a little more, but I think that gets very complicated and, and it's, it's, for us it's worked to keep things very simple and very stupid. So we're not aiming to have a balanced portfolio in any sense. We're not trying to get um, any sort of, of, of economic exposure in particular in there, though we are restricting ourselves to Western Europe, North America, and um, Australia and New Zealand at the moment, because those are the markets where we feel comfortable with the accounting rules, the legal systems, and the corporate cultures. You know, it's easier to understand what the people are telling you um, than it would be in other cultures, which we just simply don't know so well. We also have the freedom to buy distressed bonds and things like that, but we don't look for those actively. We'll buy them if we bump into them. <coughs> We do try to avoid excessive concentrations of, econ uh, of risk. We define that economically, which means um, we try to find the underlying business drivers. Right now in the classic value equity fund, we've got 15% exposure to the cruise line industry, and that's about as much risk as we, we would take in any one business. Uh, that, by the way, comes from two stocks, both of which have done really well, and so um, you can guess that those are getting close to intrinsic value. It's, it's right up. Norwegian and... Uh, Royal Caribbean, don't buy those. <laughs> as far as uh, risk control goes, the most important checks are really at the level of the analysis. What we do is we model scenarios and um, we test our assumptions carefully. We, we Ideally, we buy stocks where even if we have very conservative assumptions, we don't lose money. Um, so that would be level number one. And level number two is you don't want the company to go bust while waiting for the intrinsic value to emerge. That can happen. A company can be undervalued on a fundamental basis, but because it has a solvency problem, if it's an American, it goes chapter 11. And if it's European, it does a rights issue. Which, by the way, if any of you guys is looking for an interesting research topic, that is something that needs to be examined. I argue that American stocks deserve a risk premium because you have a much greater risk that the company will go bust. You lose all your investment as a shareholder, whereas in Europe that is not the case. They will do a dilutive rights issue, but at least you can save some money. That, by the way, is... Oh, that's right. I forgot to show you this. But it does sum it up nicely. This is what we did, for example, with Sky Deutschland. Uh, this sort of wraps everything up. You see here, we buy the... This is, sorry, the chart is in German. Uh, on the left, you've got the share price of Sky Deutschland. That's the blue line. On the right, this is the millions of flows that we have buying or selling. So if it's a positive number, we're, we're buying, and here we're selling. 
And what you see is we buy a big position, about over almost 50 million francs worth, and we get killed on it because they lose the, the football rights. An yeah, uneconomic thing, but it happened. We add it to the position, and then, because we're always looking at our best estimate of the intrinsic value, at some point we sell, the stock's gone up, and then Rupert Murdoch comes in at some point, business falls apart, they lie to us, and all that sort of stuff, but the, uh, the Rupert Murdoch comes in and he does two rights issues. Again, we're looking forward. We are not paying attention to how much money we've lost, we're looking forward. It's a terrific investment. We, can, we participate in both rights issues, and we end up making a small gain out of a huge initial loss. Uh, I'm not saying this is our best idea ever, but it does, <laughs> it does show you that, that being disciplined and paying attention to these rules that I've explained to you does work um, over time. At least I think it does. And that sort of gets me to the, mo uh, the, sort of the last thing I want to say is time really is the big ass asset that we have. We give our stocks those three years to perform. If a stock does nothing for two years and 364 days, and on the last day it pops and, and, and to intrinsic value, that's fine by us. We, we, you know, if, we, if we knew that that would happen, we would still own it. Well, no, we wouldn't do that. We'd wait until the 363rd day, but we don't know. Um, but we, we don't try and predict what a stock's going to do in the near term. We don't have to. We don't have an annual performance review. We don't have our boss or anyone else saying, well, why did you do have a terrible year this year? Well, no, our clients ask us that. And people who evaluate funds, they will ask us that for the portfolio as a whole. But they don't on a stock level basis, and we don't on a stock level basis, because we think that thanks to the diversification of the portfolio, the things that don't work will be compensated by the things that do work. And so in a sense, we're arbitraging um, something that everybody in this room could figure out for themselves too. It's not hard to figure out normalized cash flows and normalized earnings. It's just that most people don't have the time. They can't afford the luxury of waiting for a stock to reach that intrinsic value. We do. We don't ever ask the question. And I think over time um, that does help explain why, um, why value investing works. So to sum up, I don't know if it's, if, if it's patience, if it's discipline, if it's intensive research or the focus on normalized earnings and multiples that's the most important ingredient in our brand of value investing. My guess is they all work together and tie together and, and, and uh, the combination of all four is, uh, is, is what distinguishes us uh, versus others. Thanks very much. and then of, uh, 15, 20 minutes, we will open the question to all of you then. So the first question will be for Vitali. Um, you, you seem to be a big fan of Buffett, and well, his track record is quite as astonishing, but cr uh, critics mentioned that basically he's making lots of performance not by choosing the right stocks, but by selling long data puts on the S&P 500, and of course then this is a uh, three, four, five sigma event. It, don't, it doesn't show up in volatility, and basically his performance numbers are not uh, what they seem to be. Would you comment on this uh, selling put uh, argument? How do you see that? Well, I think there it's. You can argue that there was a study that showed that a lot of Buffett's success came from buying kind of very low beta stocks, and I hate to use the word beta, but have kind of very high quality non-volatile stocks and then by using float from the insurance company that provides incredible leverage so so that I would I would say that probably was a bigger historically helper to his success you know, to his incredible performance um, also I think Buffett basically it's almost like coming to a fight to some degree with both of his hands behind his back because he manages 200 something billion dollars and then his investable universe is extremely small. That that becomes a competitive advantage during the crisis because he can, you know, he can he can be kind of the lender of last resort. 
and he can get deals that you and I can't. But in some normal environment, basically his, his opportunity set is very small. So to answer, the, but I'm going to answer your question. So, I mean, that's like, you know, he does what, you know, he owns, it's a, you know, Berkshire Hathaway is a large insurance company. And you're know, basically writing those puts, right, he's, he's right, yeah, yeah. Uh, it basically, he does what, it's basically an insurance contract, uh, you know, an, an, an insurance contract. So he did the math. Kind of, it makes a lot of sense, so that's why he's doing it. He doesn't have to. He may have to mark. Does he have to mark to market? You no. Know, uh, he doesn't have to. Mark yeah. To so market. he doesn't have to. There may be mark to market, but he does not have to put up more collateral. I guess right. that, that's yeah, that's the important part. There may be mark to market every day. That, that doesn't matter as long as he doesn't have to uh, uh, put up uh, increase or decrease collateral. Basically, uh, that's an insurance contract. You know, and so that you know that makes a lot of sense. I wish I could do this. But then again, I have to have a captive uh, investor base that would be around in 10 years. You know, that's, that's a different issue. So I hope I answered your question. Uh, Guy, you, you mentioned that, uh, I mean, I, I got the impression that you're not doing any research, basically copying other value investors. Uh, could you elaborate a little bit on that? Well, I think it just reminded me of, of Madoff case, you know, all these uh, hedge fund guys doing not doing the research, but just okay. If those the other guy invests with Madoff, he, I'm sure he looked at it. So let's invest with him, Madoff as well, and then the whole thing uh, popped up. So please elaborate a bit, a little bit more on about how you do the your research. I'll, I'll elaborate on research. I just want to take you up on the Warren Buffett point for a second, if you don't mind. So the the question was, is it you? you what were the exact words you used in relation to Warren Buffett and the puts? You, Basically saying that his his risk adjusted performance is probably not as good as because, most because people he's think. Because, because he's taken more risk. Because of the, the short puts doesn't show up in the volatility of a portfolio whatsoever. I see. Yeah. Because just what comes up for me is that people keep saying, Oh well he's got a playing a different game. You know, I'd love to be playing a different game. I suspect that uh, you know, I want to set the environment up such that I don't have to be smart every day in order to win. If I can find ways to do that, that's good. What I'd point out to you is that Warren Buffett has found ways to do that in front of our eyes. And that's a good thing to find, put yourself into a structural advantage. And he's got all sorts of structural advantages. The fact that he can write those puts without having to put up collateral at all, because the credit rating of Berkshire Hathaway is so high, or the low cost capital that Vitaly mentioned. But to uh, the question of research, I believe I do a lot of research, but you know, you can come down to a philosophical question of what is the nature of knowledge in society and what is the nature of the knowledge that we are receiving. And uh, you know, uh, the, the accounts and the 10 Ks and Qs for American companies are very, very important sources of information. And I'm not saying that we should do without them, but what you're buying is the business and the business is reflected in the processes that generate those accounts. So, uh, you know, the, the, to say uh, somebody comes and says, I do an enormous amount of research, uh, there is no guarantee, I would argue, for many of the kinds of things that people claim <coughs> as research, is that they're getting better knowledge about what is going on. And I would say that the, the places where I'm trying to invest are where I don't, in a certain way, need to do more research. If I need to do more research, or if, if somebody out there has more research, or more knowledge than I do, then I'm not going to be in a place where I can invest. I need to know that the documents and the information that is being generated is sufficient for me to know that it's a deeply mispriced bet and that I have margin of safety going in there. And uh, the idea that your returns or the quality of your decision making is related to the quantity of research you do, I think is wrong, actually. I believe that uh, there's a lot of evidence that shows that if you do too much research, you end up with information paralysis, for example. And so, and I'll just finish with this point, and I, actually I'll finish this with, with this point with maybe turning and asking uh, how from this a question. I have a number of friends who are drawn to super complicated situations. They're drawn to them because they're super smart and can absorb large amounts of information and they get into the analysis. But I have found that the investments that have worked out for me the best have been so unbelievably simple. And so my question to you 
is what do you do when you have an analyst who is that way? Oh. <clears throat> I don't think I have an analyst who's that way. I'm the worst. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> no, look, you're right. You can, you can, you can, and that's the biggest problem we face is we get lost in the complexity of our own research. It's it's true. Uh, Peter Lynch uh, had the um, I think the best technique for cutting through that, which is and I, I tried to do it at my firm and it's hard. <laughs> Nobody plays by the rules. Uh, you had two minutes to make the investment case, and I think if you can boil it down to two minutes, then um, that's good. I mean that that doesn't mean you haven't done a ton of work before. You know a lot of what research is about is excluding bad things. Uh, most, most, um, most of the time when you start with an idea, you say, gee, this is terrific, it's, it's worth this much, and look, the stock price is here, I'm going to work, it's, it's, it's a 40% discount, you know, if it wasn't like that, you wouldn't do the research, right? It would not make sense. And then you find, oh, well, the pension fund, and uh, actually, that's not such a good asset, you know. And so the research process is really, it's not, it's not so much trying to understand a complex problem, you know, it's not, we're not running a, um, a nuclear hadron collider or anything like that uh, with big, comp big complicated things. It's, it's, just, it's just going through all that junk that you sometimes have to go through to, to be sure that you're not going to get blind, you're not going to get hit from a direction that you hadn't thought of in the beginning. You get blindsided. So, let me take this. Uh... So we used to, so, every, so for every company in the portfolio, we, you know, we build a model. And uh, unlike you, what we decided to do, we're going to do differently. Mm -hmm. Every financial model is going to be different because businesses are different. So, I mean, there's advantages and disadvantages to doing the way you do. And we decided we're going to basically, every model is going to be very different company to company. That, you know, and we're going to try to figure out economics of uh, a business. So if you're analyzing retail, we're going to try to figure out what is the economics of one store? If it's a restaurant company, what's the you know, economics of a restaurant? But anyway, so one thing we found, sometimes our models become huge. And uh, sometimes you get lost in those models. I'm sure you guys do it. So now we have two types of models. We have a tablecloth model, and then we have a napkin model. Okay, tablecloth is a huge model. And then for, and, but then for every single company, we have to have a, a very small napkin model. So it's something so simple that I can just understand the economics, understand the valuation in, like in, in seconds. So that was our way of dealing with that complexity. And here's the, here's the important part: if I cannot if I cannot get to the table uh, to the napkin model, probably we should not own the business because it's not simple enough for us. So, so I'm sorry, we kind of no, it's cool. Okay. okay uh, perhaps uh, Mr. Georg von Wiesner. Your presentation was quite stunning in the sense what you expected. Typical value investor starting with financial analysis and so on. Then, but then uh, long term horizon. But is there anything that keeps you awake at night? Then, or where do you? What's your biggest fear then that you're being wrong? Or my biggest worry is not finding enough cheap stocks. That's the that's the one thing. But it's, it's you know it's it's uh, that's the yeah that's the one thing. That's the thing that makes me nervous. Nothing else really makes me that nervous. But not finding enough, not having enough ideas to work on and that kind of thing, that's, I, I hate that. Okay. So then perhaps before we open up to the Q&A, uh, one question for each of you, I mean everybody here is an investor and of course we want to have some tips. Uh, let's assume for them, uh, you just can invest in one stock, then you go on the this famous island for the next 10 years, what would that be? And why? And please uh, don't use more than two minutes, as you heard before. Wait, <laughs> uh, Tully, would you like to start? Oh my God! Um, actually, sure. Um, we own this Japanese company, actually our largest holding. It's called SoftBank. It, by the way, it's not a bank. <laughs> Georg was was telling me a story how his father worked for a company and bank was in the name. And uh, my dad worked for Older Bank, so in the book, uh, Great so, Minds of Investing. Uh, I'm the son of a banker. Yeah. <laughs> so so bank. It's not a, it's it's not a bank. It's a it's a Japanese conglomerate. They own the largest one of the largest telecoms in Japan. That's not why I'm buying it. It's run by Masayoshi San, who is probably the most incredible human being ever. I wrote this article where I called him basically a combination of Steve Jobs, Warren Buffett, and uh, Richard Branson. He's uh, Steve Jobs because 
in um, 2005, before iPhone came out, he came to Steve Jobs literally with a drawing of an iPod and has some dials and said, Steve, make this for me. And, uh, and uh, Jobs said, Master, you don't tell me what to do. We'll do whatever we do. And, uh, and, but then Master Shan asked, can you just give me exclusive rights for Japan? Which basically made him incredibly successful in Japan. Uh, the reason I call him, uh, call him uh, Richard Branson because he basically bought the worst run telecom company in Japan and turned it into one of the best ones. And the reason we call him Warren Buffett because he has one of the most incredible investment records you, you know, you'll ever find. He invested $100 million in Alibaba and turned it into $70 billion investment. Long story short, here's why we own it. Uh, the value, if you do some of parts, you're gonna get, and this is in US dollars, you get about $55 of value. Today we can get to buy it for $27. Okay, in addition to that, he takes all the cash flows that telecom businesses generate and he reinvests them back uh, into internet companies in China and India. So there's so many ways to look at it, but basically this is my venture capital investment into China, internet of China and India by one of the best investors in the world. And guess what? It's like buying Warren Buffett for 50 cents. Well, except you get Branson and the other guy for free. So, <laughs> so, so it's like, you know, so that's, my, that's one of the stocks I would kind of buy and hold because I think the compound in there is going to be incredible going forward. So. That's my question. So, um, you know, it, it's a tough task because you're asking me to put all of my net worth into one stock. And I don't think that's smart in any state of the world. I think that it probably is intelligent to put your, all of your net worth into five, but to put all my net worth into one. So there are all sorts of ideas I would have given you if you had given me five. But um, uh, so I, I would put my money into Berkshire Hathaway. I don't have any problem with Warren Buffett not being there. I've spent enough time around the company to understand the values that drive that company. There's a guy called Greg Abel who runs their energy business. Just an extraordinary guy, extraordinary opportunities for reinvestment of their capital in all sorts of different directions. And the number of families, super wealthy families, people who sold their businesses to Berkshire Hathaway for billions of dollars, who have 50, 60, 70% of that net worth, worth in it is enormous. And, but ultimately, the reason is that I want to sleep well at night while I'm on that desert island. And I believe that the culture there is one that really will survive. You know, uh, that we ask that question at the end of every interview with uh, people from management. It's a temp John, from, comes from John Templeton. And the interesting thing about it is, isn't how, what the answer you get, it's what you don't get. But you want one valor, is that right? One valor, my funds. No. Um, no. Uh, <laughs> Okay, so if Thomas Brown was here, he would say Credit Suisse because we just bought that. Because, um, and then I'm going to tell you Monte dei Paschi di Siena because that's the stock I followed. He, both of them are dis at discounts about 40%. I like Monte dei Paschi because all of you are looking at me like he's, I'm, I'm insane. Mm -hmm, right? Okay, so the ECB has been all over that company's books like mud on rice because the problems that they have now started with Mario Dra uh, Draghi was the president of the Banca d'Italia so in a sense he is being blamed for the mess that that Monte dei Paschi got itself into with its own stupidity um, we, we um, think that the ECB well, and, and you know they, they failed the AQR with flying colors no one has did as badly so we're convinced that their loan book is probably one of the best analyzed in Europe. Um, it's going to be one of the best provisions because the last thing that Draghi wants is that, that his, one of his banks um, goes bust in the long term. So it's trading at 60% of book value or no below, 55%. Um, whether or not they get acquired or the management fixes it, either way, they're going to have to, they, they will over time get enough earnings power to justify a valuation of at least one times book. Because regionally where they are, so in, they're in the Toscana and the, and the Veneto and the Bit, I think, in the, the Piemont, in the Piemont. Um, they're well positioned, they're a boring old bank, that's fine. The problems that they ran into were through the Anton Veneta acquisition. Um, Monte de Paschi itself did not have such bad lending practices. Uh, so they, they essentially, they do know how to run a bank. They've recapitalized it. It's really cheap, and everybody here thinks it's crazy. So that makes it a good stock. I think over five years it will be fine, because I've got Frankfurt watching 
Uh, you know, I think if they if they put a postage stamp on a letter in Siena right now, someone from the ECB has signed off on that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Now let's go over to a Q and A. Could you then hand over the, the mic? So who would like to start? Thank you very much for all the three present presentations. I think they uh, all were very interesting. I have two questions, one for Mr. Von Wyss and one uh, for Vitaly. Um, for Mr. Von Wyss, um, you um, led us through your process, uh, how you make investment decisions. I would like to know when a company is in your portfolio and you are in this three-year period, what are you doing at this stage? How is your process in, in covering the company? Um, and what's happening after three years if the stock didn't perform? Um, is it just selling or is there a process going on where you really debate on whether you go for another three years maybe? And for Vitaly, I have the question. Um, you told us uh, at the beginning of your presentation that uh, Europeans don't get what's value investing. And since you're coming from Russia and living now in the United States, you, I guess, I assume you know both cultures a little bit. So can you give us the answer on why we don't get it and maybe the US people get it a little bit more? Thank you. Okay, so the boring process question. Um, most of our time as analysts is actually spent following the things we own. Uh, so keeping current on the company in the sense that if they uh, you know, if results come out or something happens that you, you you put that in to the spreadsheet and then you see if it changes your valuation. And the idea is or the, every analyst is supposed to update his um, valuation every six months. So every six months we get a new estimate of the intrinsic value at the latest. And obviously if something big happens, like a profit warning or God knows what, you know, so then you adjust it immediately. So we just had a discussion like that today. One of our stocks is getting killed, um, and we went, looked through the case. Um, you know, is, has even with conservative assumptions, do we buy more? The upshot on that discussion was we don't know yet. Um, the analyst is talking to the CFO tonight. We have a couple questions about the business, and then we can make a decision tomorrow on whether or not we add to the position or we don't. And then, um, so that kind of answers your second question as well, which is basically, uh, we don't uh, keep track of, well, we do keep track of when we bought the stock, obviously, we do know that, but um, it's not in relevant for the analysis. So even if we've owned it, you know, in German, it's a lot, and we, so it's, uh, <laughs> even if we've owned it for a long time, um, and we've been wrong on it, that's, the issue is not, um, we've been wrong, well, the issue is simply what's it worth? looking forward and, and do you think are you do you, obviously if you keep thinking a stock is worth more than it is and it never goes up the analyst is going to get harder and harder questions um, but um, that's that's the way it is yeah right. okay so let's clarify something I never said that European investors don't get value investing. It's my friend. Did. So I just I want to be clear about this because really I don't know. But let's say that that's the case. Okay, just all right. So I can't really comment anything about Russia because the thing about it, I left Russia was I was 18 or 19. I was interested in girls, not you know not other things. Uh, so I think so the like United States, like many other things. Think about. Ben Graham was not even born in the United States, right? But we're still, you know, but but it's in, you know ended up being a kind of U.S. concept. You know, value investing became U.S. concept. If I had to guess, I would say there is a difference. So if you just focus on the price, it's very tangible. It's visceral. Five times earnings, you get it, right? The only thing is going to take you five years to get your money back. That's extremely, extremely tangible, and that's extremely easy to export. Now, just start talking about quality, start talking about growth, and it becomes so ambiguous. Okay, and I think this is why if Europeans don't understand value investing, because that is something that is, it requires a lot more explanation. In fact, I'll take it a step further. I'm, you know, I'm a CFA, 
so I'm allowed to say negative things about CFA. Okay, <laughs> so because I'm kind of an insider, right? So, but I, so, but I, when I studied for when I studied for CFA, the experience I enjoyed the least was modern portfolio theory, right? And I think, and I would argue, and I wrote this article about this, and I, I would argue, and and Buffett said it many times, Munger said it many times. The only reason modern portfolio theory is is, is taught because it's teachable. You can you don't need to have any practical experience to teach it. You can take an accounting professor or physics professor, okay, and give them a book in three days, that person will be an expert. Okay? Because it's so it's such a beautiful, elegant formulas. Okay? So and I think so that you can kind of apply it to the kind of one dimensional value investing as well, right? Because it's so simple, okay? And so visceral. Where the other stuff is a little bit more complicated. So Next I've got a question for, for Guy, because he hasn't had one yet, but it's probably one for, for all of us. Um, Guy, you expressed um, in, my, in my ears all, almost sadness that, not, that there are not more uh, value investors in Zurich. And um, uh, as I see it, I think it's value investor outperform because not everybody is doing it, and a lot of uh, investors, especially in the big firms, you mentioned Credit Suisse and uh, uh, maybe some others, um, they they have to worry about career risk or losing um, asset under management. Uh, and so, shouldn't we be, or shouldn't you be, happy that there are not more value investors because they make your your life and maybe some of our lives easier because they are kind of uh, have different constraints. And so, every value investor is kind of unique and outperforms because. Um, yes, it's, it's advantage. You know, I think the biggest, uh, thank you for the question, I think the biggest concentration of investors, people doing fundamental analysis of companies is probably New York City. Uh, and there's some great value investors there. But I don't think that the environment that New York City has is conducive to the kind of thinking careful thinking that one needs to do in order to, I think, do the job well. I think Zurich, bar none, is, is the best environment on the planet for doing it. You've got <coughs> flights to just about every important city in the world, direct flights, you've got in, all, all the good things that we know. So geographically it's great, but I think you point out a very good point because of the structure of the industry here in Zurich being so concentrated. I think that structurally it's an awful lot harder. and. I guess, uh, uh, do I want the competition? Believe me, the competition's out there no matter how, how it happens. And I think that that's part of me trying to look beyond my own immediate needs and to say what is better for the world. And, and I think that the world is a better place when there are more contemplative investors out there. And the world is a worse place when there are a bunch of quant funds. That's what I believe. But, yeah, just yeah. Yeah, I... Um, I wouldn't say that um, we necessarily need more just value investors. I mean, more value investors would be nice too. But I think I agree with you completely that, that Switzerland should be a center for um, asset management. I don't think it's because of the big banks. I think the big bank, I disagree with you on that. I think the big banks are a good place for you know, for people to, to certainly to the young, young people to get the initial training. So in that sense, um, and then, then that they can then leave and do other things. That's a good thing. Um, but um, the problem that we have is, is, I think, is regulatory. It's FINMA. I think it's just too damn hard to start a small company. I don't think we could have started nowadays. And I think that's tragic. I think it's absolutely tragic. And, and, and then whether or not you end up doing a quad shop or a growth shop, it doesn't really matter. I think at the end of the day, if, if you have um, an asset management center, um, then um, everybody, you know, it will just be a big ecosystem where everybody makes a living and it's good. And I think then for marketing it gets easier because, look, uh, the fact that you and I are both standing up here has a little bit to do with the fact that we're both based here. So it's easier, you know, it just objectively becomes easier to market your product if people are talking about what you're doing. You know, they, they bring, oh, we need two value guys. Oh, great, okay, so you get the two value guys, um, but the two value guys get to talk about their funds. <laughs> So hopefully one or two of you will subscribe and that'll be one and then we'll be happy. But you want that effect, you know, on a bigger scale as well, not just in a room. You want it, you want it internationally. 
And um, I think we are doing ourselves an enormous disservice with uh, the regulatory burden that we put on companies right now. Uh, it's, it's sick. It's, it's, it's just absolutely uh, sick. Speaking of which, you know how sick it is. Um, the definition of a qualified investor, how many of you have looked at that, you know, to be a qualified investor? You know, so you can buy, buy hedge funds? Okay, so you need financial market experience, right? You guys all qualify because you have CFAs. I'm not sure I do because I just have an MBA. Okay, so you have a CFA, and then this is the part that kills me. If you have a physics degree, and you've studied math, or maybe you've studied chemistry, then you're allowed to buy a hedge fund. Otherwise, you're not. Think about how stupid that is. Oh my God. Think about how stupid that is. And that comes from our, our brainy regulators who don't understand the first thing about what it takes to invest. <coughs> and I think that one may come from Brussels. I'm not quite sure. Is that Brussels or is that a... Um, is that a... I get production. Swiss Finnish to me. It's just Swiss Finnish? I'm not sure it is because um, it's just, it's crazy. Yes. Uh, does this work? Yeah. Uh, so this one is for Guy. Uh, you were saying that uh, you believe that today uh, markets are more efficient than they used to be in, in uh, Buffett's time. You know that there are no more grand uh, kind of value plays anymore. And um, I, I'm not sure about that. I mean, just five years ago, you know, uh, Bill Ackman and John Paulson became billionaires because you know the whole market went completely uh, upside down. And you could buy amazing companies for like, you know, 20 cents on the dollar uh, just a few years ago. And so, and as you were mentioning, you know, Buffett closed his, uh, his hedge fund uh, at the end of the 60s because everything was overpriced. So he's been through cycles where everything was overpriced. Except that, you know, he has, as you were talking about, that capability uh, that uh, discipline to wait, to wait for the right pitch. And so I'm not sure that um, markets have matured or changed compared to his times simply because, you know, it's the same human beings behind the markets. And it's just as tough today to be uh, as disciplined and uh, with your emotions, you know, emotionally intelligent in a market than it was, you know, 50 years ago. And so hasn't the have, have the dynamics really changed? Uh, I don't disagree with uh, the fact that in 2008 there were extraordinary bargains around and anybody with the ability to invest could have made extraordinary amounts of money. But how long has the CFA been around, the, that qualification? 1963. 1963, okay, that's well before. I would argue that there are still cycles that the market goes through and I think that after 1934, a lot of people, for a generation, weren't going to buy stocks. And I, don't, I think that that did not happen after this financial crisis for all sorts of reasons. I think that the number of people in this room is an indication of that. If, if we were giving talks on value investing and there's three people in the room, then uh, I would argue that it's a different part of the cycle. Uh, but I would also argue that Warren Buffett didn't have to wait for periods of extraordinary illiquidity to pick up all sorts of bargains. And I don't think that, yeah, maybe it's a cyclical issue. Maybe I just need to wait another few years and we'll get the opportunities. So uh, I don't disagree. No, no, no. I was just going to point out that, that when, um, when Ben Graham you know, was looking for net nets, that was in the 30s and the 40s. So when, and, and there I think the market was less efficient. I mean, if you were fine, if, if, if looking for net nets works, then obviously the market is less efficient than it is today. And, and stocks were, look, what was the rule there? That stocks, that dividend yields were supposed to be higher than bonds because stocks were riskier. That was the, you know, the general accepted wisdom. But I think, by the, obviously, as you said, when Buffett closed his partnership, by that point, a lot of that inefficiency had been arbitraged out. And whether or not the market's more inefficient now than 50, 40, 50 years ago, how do we know? <laughs> so, all right, so I, I'm going to be shamelessly self-promotional because I wrote a book and a half on that, just that topic about market cycles, right? You know, so my first book called, you know, Active Value Investing, Making Money in Range of Markets. Then my follow-up was cyber, you know, just called Sideways Markets. But in the in introduction to the book, I basically make the point that 
100 years ago, people were submitting trades through Western Union, okay? Today, they are, we have the kind of Game Boy, whatever, the like a terminal that are extremely, we can, we can do trades in, in seconds, right? And, but what hasn't changed, the human emotions, that will never go away. And that's why you're gonna have market cycles. So, that part of me agrees with you. But let me tell you why I disagree with you. Um, I think in the past you used to have a competitive advantage or markets were inefficient in the sense that you could have had a competitive advantage if you had more, if you had more information. Okay, I think that's gone. I think that's what, you know, that, that, that's what, so in other words, if you had a, um, so I, uh, my, my partner at my firm, he's 73, so he's, you know, he's three years older than me. And he remembers times when, when it's basically had to go to the library to get information about stocks. That's not, you know, so that's what makes it, you know, you know what, that's what makes, it's, it makes it difficult to find a portfolio full of statistically cheap stocks. You see what I mean? Just, that are really, really cheap, actually, for the right, you know, and so, so <coughs> let me say it differently. You can still find a portfolio full of statistically cheap stocks. They just will not be trading you know, with a margin of safety. In other words, they're, not, you know, they're statistically cheap, but really not undervalued. Okay, so I think that's where I would draw a distinction. So. How do you guard against um, the possibility that you made a big mistake in terms of the intrinsic value of a company, the margin of safety employee? Would you advocate stop losses, or is there any other kind of way you might guard against that? Sure. I think <laughs> stop losses, like while investing is kind of religion, okay, to some degree. It's kind of you have these, you have these commandments, right, that came from the I gotta be careful. I gotta, okay, I gotta. <laughs> it's okay. You, you, okay, okay. You'll come back. All right. So let me just say it differently. So this is one of the things that stop losses to me go against the value investing beliefs. Just think about this. We are buying a dollar for fifty cents, right? So we're basically saying the stock is rationally priced, and stock goes from fifty cents to forty cents, right? So that that dollar now goes from fifty cents to forty cents. Nothing else has changed, right? It's it actually becomes more appealing, but the stop law says now you got now you got to sell. So, what's interesting about this? You're basically saying just because I magically touched the stock when it was at fifty cents, that becomes some kind of magical point. After you know, after below below this, I got to sell this. It's just what it when it goes from fifty cents to forty cents, and again the dollar is still there. I want to buy more. So which that's, that's why I'm saying goes against it. So the stop losses make sense if you have a strategy which is kind of a momentum strategy. You're riding momentum, and when it fades, that's, you know, that's when you sell. Okay? From value investing, stop losses basically goes you know, against that philosophical argument. So basically, you sell stocks for, for three reasons. Okay? You sell stocks when, you know, because they achieve your fair value. You sell stocks because you have something else to buy that has a better return. And then, this is the most painful one because you made a mistake, okay? You made a mistake because you have a thesis what the company is worth based on certain assumptions, and now these assumptions have been violated. That's an incredibly you know, difficult decision to make, okay? Because there are an incredible amount of uh, emotional biases. You know, you have to make a mistake, all these different things. So, and I think this is probably one of the most difficult parts of investing. Okay, it's basically saying I made a mistake, and you know, and uh, and say okay, you know, I have to sell it, but it's going to be kind of one stock at a time, and I think guy is onto something by saying I'm going to wait two years. I mean, there was something actually when I read it in your book, I thought, oh, this is actually a good idea. So I, I haven't implemented that part yet, but this is you know, may, may, I may have to do this, and maybe you 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 kick this in when the market declines a lot. So in other words, you start you know, so in other words, if you bought a stock. And a decline. You think you think you made a mistake. Maybe say, okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna sell it. However, if the whole market is declining, okay, then you say, you know what? If that's the case, I'm gonna put this, you know, two-year rule because you know maybe the whole market is impacting you, and it's kind of you know, and uh, it puts your behavioral biases kind of into steroid mode. So. Anyway.
That's my answer. So I, I, when I get asked that question, I have a question back to you, and then I have another answer, another <laughs> idea. But uh, do you own your own home, and or do you own a holiday home? Uh, yeah. uh, both. Yeah. Can I come stay? No. <laughs> but um, that's a follow-up. So you know, you buy your home, and the and the value of the home, as quoted in magazines, and you look at the back of the newspaper, went down by twenty percent. It went down by 30%. Are you going to? And I would argue that the kinds of stocks that. So if you're buying a biotech company, then news, they didn't get their trial, might impact the value of the company and maybe stop losses work. Uh, but I think that the kinds of stocks that all three of us are buying, we would analyze the way you might analyze buying your own home or buying an apartment. and. It's anathema, and we're trying to be in that frame of mind. It's a very, very different frame of mind to many people uh, who participate in the markets. But um, <laughs> the way in which I try to prevent myself from making mistakes has got nothing to do with stop losses. It's got to do with running a checklist in which I try, and I have a, it's almost 80 items now, uh, specific things that were present uh, in an investment that I or somebody I know made where they suffered a loss, and what were those things, and is it present in this idea, and is it something I should pay attention to? And I think that running a checklist is something that all investors should do, at least all value investors. Yeah, I get, I've already said, you know, we would never do a stop loss either, so we would revisit the investment case. And I think, actually, to get back to an earlier point, you can get an informational advantage by doing research. I actually think that's possible. The reason. Paulson and Ackman made all that money because they did terrific research on the mortgages, which was better than some experts like, like us, in the sense, you know, we're portfolio managers, we got killed, we didn't understand it. One of the reasons we didn't understand it was we listened to MBIA, which we owned at the time. They, they insured the CDOs and, and the, uh, the, 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 the mortgage backs. And we asked them, yeah, so what, what, what about this Ackman file? And they, well, well, you know, we look at the losses of the Texas real estate crisis, it's not going to be worse, blah, blah, blah. So all of us had the view from 30,000 feet, and, and, and Ackman and Paulson understood the bird from, from you know, the, the, in German it's the, uh, uh, the, the, the frog's perspective. Uh, they, saw the, um, they saw the way that the mortgages were actually being written, and, they, and their short was predicated on that. So they had an informational advantage that all of us could have had, too, if we'd done the work. Could I? So, I'll give it. Yeah, I was, so the, there was a paper, I forget who wrote this, and basically he said you have three competitive advantages you can have in, in the stock market. You have an informational advantage, you have a research advantage, and then you have a behavioral advantage. So I would argue that informational advantage outside of, um, outside of insider trading basically has disappeared. I Maybe mean, there is still some, however, I think this is where I'm agreeing with you, I think that advantage is still left in research. And I think if you think about what Ackman did, it wasn't really because he had, there were some people, some hedge funds do, and this is, and I, and, you know, uh, it's not because he had access to better information, I think because he'd done better research than the rest of us. So that, that's, so, so I, it's information, information was available to everybody. I think it's the research piece. And what guys try to focus on is on behavioral advantage, right? That's what, that's what you're... But I, sorry, I, want, I can disagree with both my colleagues. Here. All right. <laughs> uh, you didn't need to do any research to know that the credit default swaps on MBIA, mm -hmm. we're at an historic low. Uh, the cost of, of, of um, insuring against default on their bonds was like, um, you know, in a single digit basis points. So your average corporate spread over treasuries is 200 basis points. When you're getting into sing single digit uh, uh, basis points, the thing just has to trade at a spread of three or 400 basis points. Mm -hmm. And you've made like, you know, three or four hundred times your money. So I don't think that there was research required there. It was a one-way bet that you could just make enormous. It was, it was not just a heads I win a lot and tails. Heads I win enormous amounts of money. And I heard Bill Ackman saying, this is just so obvious. I don't know when this is going to happen or if it happens by a lot or a little. So I don't think there was a huge amount of research required there. Well, there was, there was. I, he, he, put, he had Credit Suisse do a research, a research piece on the, uh, the securities underlying the CDOs that MBIA had insured. 
That was one of the biggest spreadsheets. I, well, it's the biggest spreadsheet I've ever seen. Was, uh, and um, that was a, a bottom-up analysis. That, that was um, uh, backing up this case yeah. with well, 300 so slides. <laughs> no, it wasn't but the this, slides. It was, but just, it was, a, it it was 300 a, megabytes. It was, a, it was an asymmetric bat of enormous proportions. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm not saying it wasn't simple, but he did research, too. Okay, good. And I just have uh, maybe the, the last question. Uh, two, two very simple or quick questions, a bit technical. Uh, one, uh, when you look at company, do you actually do uh, look at different instruments, or do you just go for and stuff or whatever, do you also look at bonds and stuff for okay. valuation wise? And the second one, uh, um, uh, Vitaly, you mentioned the uh, structural uh, changes, uh, not looking at the weather but the global, global warming, etc. Mm -hmm. uh, do, do you guys see any structural change um, in, uh, or uh, an impact of the extremely low interest rate, the managed interest rate uh, environment that we're in, no market? Uh, market interest rate, obviously. How does that influence your uh, your discount uh, rate, uh, valuation part of it? That's, that's, that's the two things that I have. You know, with low interest rates, what Charlie Munger said is if you don't understand what's going on, um, if, if you're not questioning your understanding of what's going on, you haven't figured anything out. So what he's saying is that he doesn't understand uh, this environment in which banks are pushing vast amounts of money uh, into the marketplace and uh, we seem to have slightly deflation the whole time. So if Charlie Munger doesn't understand it, I certainly don't understand it. Uh, and, uh, I, I w and, and my simplistic approach is to say that if I continue to expose myself to equities over time, I should do fine. And if we end up in an inflationary environment, uh, uh, being exposed to equities is going to protect me. In terms of instruments, you can certainly do uh, intrinsic analysis and look at other instruments and in highly leveraged companies, one might want to do that. The issue that I have is that many of the rules that apply to uh, equity securities do not apply to debt instruments and bond instruments, and especially if you get into the distressed markets, I think there's a whole bunch of very, very specialized knowledge that you need to have that uh, I don't have that experience, neither do I have the people in-house to do it, so I try to stay away if I can't invest in the equity portion. All right. Um, we just opened this huge can of worms, and I, I'm sorry. Uh, so the, the, the second question then. Um, so we, I, I did a lot of thinking about this, and you know, one thing I realized that theme and kind of dovetailing on this Charlie Munger's uh, quote, which says exactly, if you're not confused about global economy, you don't understand it. So this, this is it. I, I've said it so many times. No, I've said it so many times. I can memorize it now. Uh, but so let me give you an example. How I th so the the problem is I think we may find the impacts of this incredibly low interest rates in these places that we just never expected to find them. So the aftershocks will be tremendous. So I was looking at an insurance company, okay, and uh, insurance company was t basically told me that. If you look at the bonds, catastrophic bonds in insurance space, the yields there have been driven down tremendously by hedge funds. Okay, so what so the other insurance companies had to do? So if insurance company basically said, well, it's just uneconomical to, for us to buy those bonds now anymore, so they had to go, so they left the space and went somewhere else. Right. The problem is everybody else is doing it too. Right. So it's now it impacts started to buy started to impact other niche pockets of the insurance space, okay? So if you, for instance, if you buy an insurance company today, there is a good chance that they are underpricing risk because the liquidity is basically, if you think about what the QE did, basically pushed, pushed everybody on the higher risk curve. People who used to own treasuries now own corporate bonds, you know, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So we constantly try to think about, okay, what are we missing? Where else could it could we find so you know could we find this risk, and uh, I think the un unintended consequences of the of the QE are going to be much much greater than everybody expects. And so when in our the way we do the the way we try when we look at stocks, we try to err on the side of basically leverage, you know so so exposure and leverage. We want to own companies that have a lot of cash, and we want companies that are like. 
I do basically insurance industry to me right now is kind of, I, I cannot own it because I'm not sure. And so I, I know it's going to impact them. I have no idea, you know, if that company will impact it or not. So that just will be one example where we say, just not going to buy those stocks. So try to avoid, throw avoidance. That's another way for us. And uh, I think uh, credit instruments require, Guy is absolutely right. I think credit instruments require uh, knowledge of, you know, very specialized knowledge of covenants. And uh, larger shops can add value there. Howard Marks can add value there. Uh, we, for the most part, we stick to equities for that reason, because we don't, you know, we know it's outside of core confidence. Yes. So we do do distressed bonds if we find them. We don't look for them, but if we find them, especially Swiss franc bonds for American issuers are often a good thing because they kind of get overlooked. You know, it's sort of the same mindset that we don't understand value in Europe. <laughs> we don't get it. They sort of think that um, you know there can't be bonds in Europe, so you can get them cheaper than, for example, you could get the same the same bond in America if a company has problems. So we'll do it. Um, we haven't. We've never played a restructuring though. You know, a bankruptcy or the, the, the debt for equity swap type situation. We've never done that before. But never say never. As far as low interest rates goes. Um, it doesn't make us change our, our discount rate. We stay at 10% because we're long-term and we're going to assume they're going to normalize. And it's just too, yeah, I don't think it's the right thing to do. Um, it's, we, we sometimes try to figure out if low interest rates are an opportunity. And I agree with you, Vitaly, that it's a, you know, for insurance companies, it's such a big problem that we ended up selling Swiss Re and Zurich last year. And then, but for banks, it's good, right? The ECB <laughs> wants them to make money so they can recapitalize. You know, Monte de Bosque is borrowing a lot of cheap money through the TLRO through from the ECB, so that's good. So you can make money on it that way. Also, if they can lend it, and they don't, you know, right? The problem is the loan growth, but that's starting to pick up. So, let me just add one more thing. I forgot. So the one thing most we don't know, I mean, you know, will low, these low interest rates lead to high interest rates or low interest rates? And I'm worried about both. Just think about Japan, right? They had low interest rates for 20 years, okay? So you want to position your portfolio kind of for I don't know world, kind of, you know, you should, should be fine, you know, so if you are, here's the problem, was I see people who are inflationist and deflationist, and, and uh, those people who fall into one of those camps, they're very myopic. They basically believe in inflation or deflation, and then and it almost becomes like a religion. You know, they, they can argue one point and they don't want to see anything else. The problem is the cost of being wrong, if you just follow one strategy versus another, is enormous, right? Because if you're an inflationist, I don't know, you're going to have a lot of gold. If you're a deflationist, you're going to own 30 bonds, right? And God forbid you're wrong. If you're right, you're going to make a lot of money. No, no question about it. God forbid you're wrong. So I call it basically having a second best hand in poker. So if you play poker, you know that the worst thing that can happen to you, you have an incredibly good hand and you go all in. And then you find out that somebody has this kind of low probability hand, but it's just a little bit better than yours. And you lose everything, right? So the, those inflationists and deflationists, in my mind, they're kind of exposing themselves to that risk. And in our portfolio, we try to kind of put a portfolio for this more humble view that we don't know. We don't know how the future is going to look like. We're just trying to, you know, to survive. So that's, sorry. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. Um, I think we've had a fantastic presentation here from a, a treasure trove, really, of uh, value investing uh, specialists and experts over the last, uh, I don't know, how, how many years, how many decades of uh, value investing do we have here on, uh, on these tables? Thanks, thanks for your precision on that. <laughs> there you go. I should have asked that at the start. Plenty. So I've been running Aquamarine Fund for 18 years. 18? 17. 17? Yeah, well, 20. Uh, so, uh, funds, funds, funds the same as guys, but yeah. I worked for a value guy before that. Okay. Well, we're approaching almost 60 years of, uh, of uh, value investing confidence here, uh, just on these three tables, and uh, you've had the opportunity of asking lots of questions. Uh, at the panel, and now we will have the opportunity to ask you more questions during drinks, I hope. Uh, so uh, thank you very much to you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.